Good morning, everyone. We're about to start. I draw your attention to your cell phones, please. Please attend to your cell phones. We have two tributes, followed by the remembrance. And we ask Carl to come now, please. I did this some 99, and it appeared in the Observer. And I told them whether what of us died before, it should be read. I won't deal with it in, in, in its entirety. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun, or fester like a sore? and then run. He attended one of the prestigious high school in Kingston and excelled in sports and also academically. He was well liked and had a dynamic personality which endeared him to one and all. He could light a room with his tall, six foot muscular frame. He commanded the English language and used it potently while growing up in no, what is you, 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 what is now called the inner city, everyone knew he would come to something good. He was voted the most likely to succeed from the five brothers. He was, he was successful in his common entrance examination while attending an, an all-age school in Jonestown. No one expected any less from the result. At high school, the more privilege gravitated to this youth from an humble background, but with strong family support. He attracted them with his prowess on the football field and eloquence in frequent arguments in, in and outside the classroom. Like one of his hero, Malcolm X, he was a dynamic in his presentation. At 10 year old, he could kick a football further than many boys, much older than he was. He played the Manning Cup, all schools, and had the distinction of representing Jamaica on the team that beat 80 for that went to it went to the World Cup. Eighteen. He was on the team. He had a dangerous free kick and once scored a spectacular shot against the famous Light Respect Morgan of Boystown in the seventies, which is still talked about in football circle of one of the best free kicks seen locally. I saw him score a similar kick in a match for Georges against Jamaica College from almost midway the half line. Invariably, he got a football scholarship to the USA and continued to perform well in, in the academic and scholastic fees. He was on the Dean's Honors List and a regular fixture on varsity soccer team. Again, the tremendous kick that he had recognized, that was recognized the university football team, that is different from our team, was considered using him for field kicks. But he declined the offer. The story now changes. Somehow, somewhere, our emerging era start changing and show feet of clay. At this stage, he, he had some problem, and um, somehow, sometime, in order to be loved or accepted, and probably this was happening to him, he went away and was exposed to a situation which was, it was during the Black Power Conscious period, and he, he was, uh, 
my daughter, my niece, whose father is here, research on, on, on his period at Michigan University. And he was highly recognized and respected. And unlike some people who say, yes, I get my football scholarship, um, I going to come and do, um, get involved in change. I think it's the essence of the goodest of family. We always want to bring about change. And more or less, that's what's happened. May soul rest in peace and God protect to her. not be fooled by the portfolio. There's not much in it. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, the, the view, the perspective that I am about to bring really and truly is from my cousins, um, particularly those who would have attended St. George's College. It's kind of difficult, not kind of, difficult when you enter an institution such as St. George's College, and from day one, you're being asked to fill the shoes of somebody who is a once in a lifetime type of person. If you, I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say to you. Um, Uncle Nigel would have embodied everything that is taught at St. George's College. Um, the Georgian is a man for other people, you know, somebody who is going to stand up for other people, speak for other people, be a team person and help other people to be what they can be, to be the best they can be. Uh, I spoke to different persons, um, you know, about my uncle. I didn't know much about him during that period some things here and there, saw him every none, but the, the men in my family tend not to talk that much about themselves, I don't know why, but it is one of those things. You see other persons and, why, you know your uncle, your uncle did this, your uncle did that, and I say, really? I didn't know that. And I say, yeah, your, your, your uncle this, and your uncle is, it, um, was one of the brightest. In fact, the church that I attend, in the church, just walking through, somebody stopped me. You're good, sir, right? And I said, yes. The gentleman worked at God's man. He's the chief, at the time he was a, the chief accounting person at God's man, Mr. Griffiths. And he said to me, you know Pumi? And I said, he's my uncle. And he said, that man, that man, he was an inspiration to me in school. Now, it's hard for me from the position that I am standing, not knowing that much um, about the situation and the circumstance. Mr. Griffiths is a brilliant man by all accounts, a brilliant man. So much so, he's, he was in charge of just about everything for God's man, account-wise. And the way he spoke of Uncle Nigel, said to me that boy i really should have been there more with him sitting down and listen to him speak we hear about the football and all of that i don't need to talk about the football i don't need to talk about the track and field and all of that i really want to focus on the man himself because i was taken aback that somebody from a humble background just as uncle carl had um, noted before who given an opportunity to educate yourself freely, to further yourself in such a way, would sacrifice, would make a huge sacrifice by protesting the lynching of a young man in that area in Michigan, and Michigan is known to be one of those places that, that is particularly 
harsh on persons of color. It's just a nice way of saying a racist place. That he would sacrifice all of, the, all of that on principle. And that is what I want everybody to remember. Because this world today does not have, don't have enough of those persons. We don't have enough of those persons in this world. So when you go, when you leave here today, you leave this space, you remember that. And if you are able to influence or mentor anybody else in this stage, put them along that path and along that line. Because it is not everything, this world is very materialistic. It's very materialistic. And the things that are, that are important are dwindling, fading away, being pushed away somewhere. And we need more persons to stand up like he did. Thank you very much. Good morning, and thank you for coming. Those were the last words that my brother Nigel spoke to, my brother Keith and myself, exactly two weeks ago, when we went out to Harborview to visit him, take him a nice lunch. I just got up the morning and said, I'm gonna make a soup for Nigel. We made him some lovely soup and got some, anyway, we made him a very nice lunch and we took it out there and sit in with him for a little while and it was really lovely. We had a lovely conversation. The week before, my son Miles and Keith and I had gone out there to see him. And I've been seeing quite a lot of him the past few, few, three or four weeks. But when we left, he just said in this beautiful, clear voice, thank you for coming. And I think, knowing Nigel, that he meant me to tell this to you this morning. Thank you, everybody, was shown up today for Nigel. We, we thank in particular our elder, our venerable eldest Goodison, Howard Goodison in the front row, was made it all the way from Atlanta to be with his baby brother at the last. We thank Paulette, his daughter, who is our family come to help us, as my mother would say. She's dearly loved by us all. Thank you, Paulette, for coming. Thank you to Ted Chamberlain, who is Nigel's brother-in-law, and my husband, who came from Vancouver to be with Nigel today. And thank you all, and maybe people from some, but all of you, old friends, new friends, school friends, thank you so much for coming. Thank you to the neighbors in Harborview, and the friends, family members, particularly Carol, who across the street was Nigel's friend, Thank you to Sasha, and thank you to Tracy, who was so good to him at the last, and Richard. Thank you all, everybody. Thank you to our brother Carl, who has done years of service to help to take care of Nigel. Thank you. Thank you so much. And spectacularly to our brother Keith, who this family cannot possibly repay Keith for what he does for us. He is a businessman, and he's the one who organizes things like funerals. He did, my, he did my sister Betty's, he's doing this one. He, he's just, he did my mother's. Every detail attended to. And if this occasion is what it is this morning, we have to thank you, Keith. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Nigel. Nigel Norman Goodison, ninth child and sixth son of Doris Louise Harvey Goodison and Vivian Marcus Goodison was a wash belly. My mother said she didn't think she was having any more children, and then here comes Nigel. He was born, it seems, I was talking to Howie a while ago, that he was born during that storm in 1951. It may have been Hurricane Charlie. But I remember my very first, well, first I remember feeling very put out that he 
was a baby of the family, because up until that point, I was. And then he came and everybody just worshipped this. He looked like one of those cherubs in Renaissance paintings. He was pretty and plump and sweet. And then everybody is just paying him all the attention. And then, but I remember vividly in the middle of the storm, they put him, they put, my mother pulled out the second drawer of the bureau and put him in there to keep him secure and safe while the storm was just howling around him. But in retrospect, that makes sense because Nigel was a force of nature. As Carl said, any room he entered lit up immediately. And he just, he, he was just Nigel, pull me. And there are some things that absolutely amaze me about Nigel. I have to say this. Nigel could drive a car from the time he was about, about seven. My father used to put him on his lap and make him steer. And all of us would say, no, I don't do that, man, the car crash. But he would allow him to steer. And then he taught him to change the gears. And as soon as, and he was, he, he was a very tall guy. So when he grew to the height where he could just touch a pedal, he just drove. So he could see, like the this eight-year-old child, he would drive, drive a car. I took my license like six times, so I was very impressed by that. But, the, and that's one, I'm just remembering a couple of things about Nigel. The second thing is that, Kingsley will remember this, we took him to church when he was like four or five. And Nigel went to church, and when he started to play, he got up on the bench and started to dance and clap. And in those days, he didn't do those things in church, not in an Anglican church in Jamaica. So we had to hurry him out of there. And when he was leaving, he said, why the man of on a frock? He was talking to <laughs> But, but that, that was just Nigel. Yeah, I think Kingsley had to kind of just say, come Nigel, come. You know? I remember something else about him and Uncle, him and Paulette. Paulette, he was four years older than Paulette. And honestly, we saw him one day, he had seated Paulette on top of the step and he was saying to her very seriously, now I am your uncle and you are to call me Uncle Nigel. Do you understand? <laughs> he was just, he knew his word from he was little. Nigel was the most eloquent speaker, bar none, that I have ever heard, honestly. Whole fully formed grammatically correct sentences would just flow from him. And he was equally um, fluent in Pato, of course. They kept referring to his forensic eloquence during his school time. People were just, every time he opened the mouth, you were just absolutely blown away by what was coming out of it. He loved Latin, he was good at Latin. He was not averse to leaving your company and going dominus with his scum, you know? He just, he was just, his mind was always working in that way. I am not going to go anywhere near his skills as an athlete or soccer player, because I will make an idiot of myself. I don't know anything about those. But people will insist on stopping me in the street and telling me about things like the goal he scored from the half line against JC. <clears throat> and my friend, um, Dr. Brian Meeks, has never had a conversation with me in which he never mentioned. He said he thought Nigel was the best football player he had ever seen. I, I don't know about that. But my personal memories of Nigel were really heightened. They, they became very, Nigel and I became sort of Keith, Nigel, and myself are the three last ones. And we were always very close. But when my father died, which was a terrible thing for, for him, because they were, my father and Nigel, were, they were so close. He was his baby. We were sent to live in Garden Town with my sister, Barbara Gloudan, and our husband, Ansi Gloudan. And they didn't have any children then, so it was just the two of us in their house. And, um, but we were sent there to finish school. He had St. George, and I, and I was at St. Hughes. And it was then I realized also how absolutely brilliant Nigel was. You can, people throw that word around, but honestly, I think if they had tested him, his IQ would have been off the charts. For one thing, he was, the two of us shared a love of poetry. And Nigel was excellent at memorizing long passages, both of prose and poetry. And, just, and then he would enter elocution contest at St. George's and just win. No, honestly, he, was, he would ref long things out from Shakespeare. I remember he did, um, the, the, he knew the rhyme of the ancient mariner, the Samuel Taylor Coleridge rhyme of the ancient mariner, a long, long poem. He just re recited it. Of course, being Nigel, he then created a parody of the rhyme of the ancient mariner 
And the ancient mariner became a man who had an ancient marina that was all too holy, holy and terror. But that was just how we were. You, you recognize Nigel here. But the, something that really stuck with me was that <coughs> in one of his elocution contests, <coughs> he had to do the Ballad of Reading Jail by Oscar Wilde. And he, it's a very sad poem about somebody who has fallen from grace in a big way. And I think he was a, a little afraid of that poem because what he did was he, he kind of su sabotaged himself. He was winning. And then he went to school in the morning. I said, all right, Nigel, good luck, you know. And when I come, I said, how did the thing go? He said, well, I was doing all right. And I start off, he walked among the trial men in a suit of shabby gray. A cricket cap was on his head. And he said, when I reach the part about the cricket cap, I just bend down and let go two of cricket strokes. And father says foolishness that that must come out. And thereby, yeah. Father said that was entirely unnecessary, and that is how he didn't win the contest. But what I remember most about Nigel was his absolute focus, and he could, do, he could multitask easily, he did a number of things at the same time, all at once, he could just do them. But he was extremely focused, and he was focused on particular things at particular times. At this time, while he was doing his schoolwork, he was focused on having fun. Nigel never spent one weekend in Garden Town. I'm telling you. No, no Friday, Saturday, or Sunday ever saw him. Because, you know, it, it's country. Those days it was very countrified. So on Thursday night, he would see packing his big Adidas bag with his clothes for the weekend. And you would hear him talking to his troops on the ground, you know. Who apparently during the week you now were reconnoitering the situation as to where the party was. And he would take the bus down on King Street on a, Sunday, on a Friday afternoon and land in, go in, in Harborview. And the, he would just party the whole weekend. He had, a, he had a posse. Billy Perkins, I'm going to call people here that some of you know. Danny Flash. Um, the two Reed brothers, Max Reed and his brother. Busby. You, you, remember, you, you remember all of them. But they were de dedicated to party. They partied over the main side of Harborview. I don't know where they from. I think there must have been people sending them bulletins where the parties were. And they partied over that side of Harborview and then they would cross over the river and then they would party over the river. I think they pressed as far as Bull Bay. They may even have gone to Moran Point. I don't know, but the one thing that Nigel did for those years was party. He was the best DJ and is not true. When Nigel was at the turntable, the party couldn't, nobody sit down. When he got up to dance, he was the best dancer. I mean, you better just sit down and watch him when he dance. And he all, and so many, so his whole um, touring partners are there, you know, I see Marie and I see Valerie and all of those people. <laughs> they know what I'm talking about. These people, he was just dedicated to having a good time. But he still managed to do excellently in school. And he, he, was, he was very, he was excellent at English, uh, English literature and economics and he, went, he, was, he wanted to be a, a trade unionist. But in all of this, Nigel thrived under the rigor of the Jesuit system. A lot of people are taught by Jesuits are given that, that sort of rigorous focus on things and particularly on social justice. Some of these priests that would have taught Nigel would have been li liberation theologists theologians, they all were passionately consumed by social justice. And Nigel was a Buddhist, and we all have that in good measure. But I think his teaching just, it just heightened that. And so he went away, and we all know, we were, I won't go over into what happened, except I spent some time in Michigan afterwards, and people still remembered him for the passion that he brought to, trying to bring about justice for not his people, for other people. As a, 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 somebody at the University of Michigan said to me, he was trying to help us, wasn't he? An African-American gentleman, he said, he gave up, he really, he destroyed his health and eventually his life in the cause of just trying to bring justice. There are pictures of Nigel on, in Jet Magazine, if you can find those things. I don't think there's another Jamaican who had the honor of being elected to speak on behalf of like the, the athletes at Michigan who presented to the Big Ten. 
I lived in Michigan. The Big Ten is like one of the biggest organizations in the United States of America. And he was the one who was given the charge to go and present the case for the athletes to the Big Ten in Chicago. There are, there are a couple of pictures of him coming down a plane step, going to this meeting, in a big meeting, talking to these big capitalist gentlemen who own football in America and putting the case to them that they should treat athletes better. That was Nigel. He had a large and loving heart. Large, large-hearted fellow. So when we talk about those years after all of that, the one thing we should remember is that maybe some people believe it fate, kismet. They said that some people believe that like a born and you come into life and you pick up a script and that's your script and you have to see it through to the end. If that is so, then Nigel's script contained great sorrow, but he also got a great measure of joy. He was a loved person. Uh, people love Nigel. Look at you all here this morning. You're here because you love him. And if that was his fate, his name means champion. And that boy him take him fate like a champion. He took that cup of bitterness and that life gave him and he drank it down to the dregs. I want to tell you this one thing. When we saw him last week, Keith and I saw him and we spent a lovely time with him. Breast assured, something had happened. He had been ill and he was in hospital, so maybe a lot of stuff had come out. His, his system was clear of a lot of things that were hindering him. But he was as peaceful and as lucid and as sweet-natured as I've seen him in the longest while. Honestly, he was talking to us in totally rational, totally level. He and Keith were making arrangements to get some things done. He said he wanted to go and watch some football. He was still funny. He had heard about the death of a friend of ours, Helen, and he was very moved. All his faculties were there, all his emotions, everything was there. He was intact. It's like he was right back to Nigel again. So if he's gone home, he has gone home as Nigel. Rest assured that he's himself. His heart was broken for love and for love and justice. But he was a lovely, lovely soul. And I think, as he said, thank you for coming. And we want to say to Pumi, Pumi, thank you for coming. Because man, what a life it would have been if we had never known Nigel. And I'm so, he, was, he was just the best. And I thank you all for knowing that. And God bless you all and peace.
Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Even so say the Spirit, for they rest from their neighbors. With faith in Jesus Christ, we receive the body of our brother Nigel for burial. Our brother was washed in holy baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Let us therefore with confidence pray to God our Heavenly Father, the giver of life, that he will raise him to perfection in the company of the saints. I bless the body of our brother Niger with holy water that recalls his baptism of which St. Paul writes. All of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. By baptism in his death, we were buried together with him so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him by likeness to his death, so shall we be united with him by likeness to his resurrection. On the day of his baptism, Nigel was incorporated into Christ. On the day of Christ's coming, may he be clothed with glory. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God of grace and glory, we remember before you this day our brother Nigel. We thank you for giving him to us, his family and friends, to know and love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, Console us who mourn. Give us faith to see in death the gate of eternal life, so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course on earth until, by your call, we are reunited with those who have gone before through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
resurrection of your son Jesus Christ destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light grant that your servant Nigel being raised with Christ may know the strength of his presence and rejoice in his eternal glory who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Word of God, written in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 31 to 39. A reading from the Word of God written in Lamentation chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. But this I call to mind, and therefore I hope the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saves my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thine ocean grace bestoweth. 
A reading from the Word of God, written in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes. Who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed intercedes for us? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord.
a reading from the Word of God, written in St. John chapter 11, <clears throat> verses 21 to 27. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even though I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the first and the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And evermore who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us bow our heads as we pray. Teach us your way, O Lord. Teach us your way. Help us to walk more by faith and less by sight. Teach us your way. Keep us still and draw us to yourself so that we may know your will. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We come to celebrate the life of our brother, Nigel. I feel a lot of affinity in this situation. Although Nigel went to that school on the other side of North Street. There is forgiveness. We come to celebrate the life of our father, to Paulette. We come to celebrate the life of one who remained a sibling to Bonnie, Keith, Howard, King Leander, despite him displacing Lorna at birth, where he became the life of the party. And I'm certain, Lorna, you can understand when you have the wash belly. And that's what we call them in Jamaican culture, wash belly. And so he has come to be this child of God a morning star. He had a charisma that was unique, that could only be matched by Michael Manley. He had a finesse of the language and a presence when he stepped into any place, be it on the field or on the floor of a party. His charisma reflected a giftedness he received from God. We come to celebrate this morning star, a gift from God to us. And so, beloved, despite the tears, we need to see in our brother that seed of faith planted in him the sacred seed that Nigel received from family. We come to celebrate his life, rooted in a family that had the advocacy for social justice and nurtured by the church. 
in the arena of social advocacy and justice. So Nigel was willing to give his time, his talent, and his abilities always for those who we would call the underdog. That was his orientation and his disposition. Nurtured in family and uh, nourished by the church, the sacred seed. And this sacred seed in which Nigel was nurtured influenced his life. And therefore, we come as people of faith. The Paschal candle there burns to indicate to us that the life of faith burns beyond the darkness of life. And so, beloved, we hear the words of Jesus saying, in the midst of grief and pain to two sisters who had lost their brother, if you had been here, he would not have died. But Jesus went on to indicate that Lazarus, his good friend, would be raised again. Lazarus was Jesus' good friend. I'm certain in our Jamaican culture we would say he was a good friend, he would be able to sit down and knock two dominoes. He was a good friend and therefore it is the only person in scripture of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John where we hear as a death the shortest verse in scripture. Jesus wept. He wept at the grave of Lazarus, his good friend, indicating to us our humanness, our humanness. And so on Ash Wednesday, the church placed an emphasis on this humanness by saying, remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Those words come to us from the book of Genesis, chapter 3, where after Adam and Eve had received the verdict for disobedience, that there would be death, the Lord God saw them being exposed, naked, vulnerable, and the Lord God clothed them and embraced them, despite their disobedience. A message for us that there is no sin that is unforgivable. Regardless what you may hear in other faith communities or other persons saying, there is no transgression, no sin that is unforgivable. If there is a sin which is unforgivable, therefore that sin is greater than God. And we hear in scripture that the Lord God our creator who has shaped us and given us unique personalities is a God who is always willing to forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive. For nothing as Paul says in Romans can separate us from that love of God. Nothing in all creation. It's a persistent love. It's a love that is always seeking out our welfare and our well-being. A love that is self-giving. A love that is willing to sacrifice itself for the good of others. Nigel received the seed of faith from his family, his parents, his siblings are nurtured by the church. Beloved, we need to nurture that seed of faith. We nurture it in prayer and in worship and in saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the breath of life that I breathe, despite me being dust. And to dust I shall return. Thank you, Lord, 
for a mind to think, for a heart to love. Thank you, Lord. The sacred seed, the breath of life we have received from God the Father. But somehow, sisters and brothers, and note the emphasis here, that somehow the fear agenda seemed to have an inclination to this, than the male ladies and women seem to awaken to this spiritual reality more than men folk. The research shows that men folk are afraid of three things, among other things in life. Men folk are afraid to go to the dentist. Lana asks them, when last you go to the dentist? It will be embarrassing to ask the men folk here today, when last have you been to the dentist? But then we can make another step, Sister Lorna, and ask the men folk here, when last have you been to the doctor? When last have you been, because most of them are over 35, 40, when last have you been to check your prostate? So men folk are reluctant to see the dentist, to go and see the doctor. And there's a third one. Men folk are reluctant to be in let me hear you say it. Church. That's the data. That's the research. Yet, the fear agenda have awakened to the spiritual reality that going to see the medical practitioner and being in church is necessary to nurture the seed of faith. For you see, beloved sisters and brothers, the seed of faith must be rooted and grounded so that when we face the storm and the stretch of life, we may be shaken but never shattered. When the seed of faith is not nurtured and nourished, then you'll find when you face the stress and storm of life, you're not just shaken, but you're shattered. So after a hurricane, you will see where those trees that have tap roots, just a little below the surface, with the storm, they get knocked over. The roots are not deep. We see where on Valentine's Day, where those flowers seem so beautiful, the rose is so red, they only last for a while because the roots have been cut off. The seed of faith needs to be nurtured. It needs to be nourished. And we know our brother Nigel went off to Michigan. There was some disconnect from the roots of family that nurtured him, the church that nurtured him in a foreign place. Can you imagine a young man? Can you imagine a young man being in this foreign place? How many people did you know up there? You know, I, I, I remember the first time that I, it was my family who did it, who felt that I needed to come to New York because so many of them up there. But me, they just afraid because I said, boy, them not have, I can't sell fish up there, nor yam and banana, I peer fry food. I had only been about 12 years. But I never forget when I landed in Kennedy Airport and stepped out. I felt so shocked. I felt so afraid. When I went out and family greeted me, I still felt afraid because I was in this alien place, this foreign place, intimidating. I can imagine our brother Nigel being in that place. Yes, among some people who he knew. Yes, connecting with new friends and what have you. However, the nurturing of family and church had been displaced. So beloved, Jesus invites us 
to be nurtured and nourished by giving thanks. And so he says, when you pray, you must say, Abba Patir, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. It's a one prayer that fits everybody. It's a one prayer that will enlighten your heart and lift you up. It's a prayer you can rely on. It's a prayer you can say secretly to yourself or you can say it out loud. But in connecting with that prayer, it is the Spirit of God that will raise you up and lead, lift you as the seed, the sacred seed within the heart of your soul will blossom and flourish. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's a recognition that you have been shaped in a unique way by God. And you have been given the breath of life by God. And so what can you say? Thank you, Lord. Let me hear you say it. Let me hear you say it. Everybody. Thank you, Lord. Thank God. You know, there, there is something we're forgetting in Jamaica, you know. And... Uh, it is something where our great-grandparents and parents taught you. One of the things that we are taught in Jamaica is that, you see, Miss Madi do something for you. You say what? Thank you. Thank you. As a child, you go to the street and somebody do something for you, and I say, thank you. Believe me, if they reach back a yard and tell your people, sorry for you. Sorry for you. But somehow, we have reached a point with digital technology today to believe that we are greater than ourselves. We have arrived. We have reached the moon and therefore, these nurturing things, they are no longer relevant. These nurturing things, they are no longer necessary. For our common life together and Jesus invites us to express that prayer for he said to Martha and Mary Lazarus shall be raised again life together in community and so it is in sharing and giving of ourselves that we experience the joy of life as we say thank you. The sharing of self and the giving of self and the social gospel of the church as we hear it from Matthew. Matthew's gospel. We hear Jesus saying that on that day you're not going to be judged by whether you are morally right or ethically on the right path. What Jesus says, I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was sick and you did not visit me. And by the way, you see when the thought come to you these days about a brother or a sister and I'm sick, go see them. Go and see them. Don't put it off and say, well, you know, my busy, my busy my, but tomorrow or the next. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Don't do it. The thought come to you. You hear about John? Him not well? You hear about Mary? Sick hospital? Why should I should have go see them, you know? You know, but. And then you hear say, John died. I said, wow, rock stone. Mm. You start to feel guilty. I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was sick, did you visit me? I was naked, did you clothe me? That's the litmus test of social salvation in the kingdom of God. Nigel. A social activist 
gave of himself and he served and served well by sacrificing his life and so the saint of the church has given us the prayer that encapsulates the giving of self for others and for service in the prayer which says teach us lord to serve at the best of our ability to give and not to count the cost to fight and not to heed the wounds to toil and not to seek for rest to labor and here it is and not to ask for any reward in other words don't be a politician save that of knowing you are doing the will of God the Father so as we celebrate the life of our brother Nigel we do so in the faith of Jesus Christ for he received the seed of faith planted in his soul, watered by the Spirit of God, as he gave of himself, as he remained a child of God, one who was baptized in the faith of Jesus Christ, who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Amen. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. As printed on page four of our order of service, let us stand for the Apostles' Creed, the Creed of the Baptized. Let us stand. In assurance of eternal life given at baptism, let us proclaim our faith and say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. We pray, let us pray. We thank you, Father, that your Son, Jesus Christ, came to die for us. We thank you that you raised him from the dead for the salvation of all. Grant, Almighty God, that your servants may know the fullness of life which you have promised to those who love you. Lord, in your mercy, May we be strengthened in our faith that we may live the rest of our lives in fellowship with your Son and be ready when you call us to the fullness of eternal life. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for Nigel's family. Be close to them in their loss. Console them in their grief and surround them with your undying love and grace. Lord, in your mercy, we thank you for the gift of life and for the life of Nigel. Show your mercy to the dying. Strengthen them with, the hope, with hope and fill them with the peace and joy of your presence. Lord, in your mercy, we commend all people to your unfailing love, that in them your will may be fulfilled 
and we rejoice at the faithful witness of your saints in every age, praying that we may share with them in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, as our Savior has taught us, so we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Father of all, we pray to you for Nigel and for all those whom we love but see no longer. Grant to them eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. May he and all the faithful departed to the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen.
Amen. We now come to commend our brother into the arms and mercy of God, where he now rests in the paradise of God and uh, is surrounded by the angels and the archangels in the sanctuary of the presence of God. Let us stand. The commendation is printed on page six of your order of service. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant Niger with your saints. Where sorrow, sorrow and pain are, are no more, neither sign, but life everlasting. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of humankind, and we are mortal, formed of the earth, and to earth shall we return. For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, that even at the grave we make our song, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. 
Give, Give rest, rest to Christ, Christ to your servant, Nigel, Nigel with your saints, saints where sorrow and pain are no more, more neither sign, but life God. everlasting. Let us commend our brother Nigel to the mercy of God, our Maker and Redeemer. Deliver your servant Nigel, O Sovereign Lord Christ, from all evil, and set him free from every bond, that he may rest with all your saints in the eternal habitations, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Nigel. I acknowledge we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Amen. In the paradise may the angels lead you. At your coming may the martyrs receive you and take you into the holy city, Jerusalem. May the choirs of angels receive you and may you with Lazarus, who was once poor, have eternal rest. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.